Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, coming your way on a Saturday night. It's 11 o'clock Eastern time. So for the final in my series, rating and ranking the conferences, I thought I'd do a live stream and get your input into my formula and uh, the comparison between the conferences. We knocked out the Pac-12, the Big 12, the ACC and the Big 10. So the Pac-12, eight and nine against the other four conferences, the Big 12 at eight and eight, the Big 10 at 16 and seven, the ACC 11 and 18, but those are just against the four other conferences. I gave you tons of stats to go on and the formula has to do with, of course, just the conference play against each other, the non-conference games in the power of five. So I'm gonna call up the chat and hopefully you guys have some interesting uh, observations and suggestions for my formula. One would be to measure the home versus the road games. That certainly makes a whole lot of sense. I get that. And uh, the other would be to put in some type of score factor. Of course, uh, let's say Oklahoma, Georgia, of course, that was a huge game in the Rose Bowl. Uh, two number one seeds uh, out of the Big 12 in the SEC, and Georgia wins that game coming back from 17 down to defeat Oklahoma 54-48 in overtime. So let's say Georgia wins that game 35 to nothing. Should they be given more credit and the SEC, therefore, more credit for a 35 to nothing win over Oklahoma than a 54 to 48 barn burner in which the teams were separated by that much in overtime. All right, we got Ryan on the line. SEC is live because it's the conference that everyone cares about. Sure, we'll let you get away with that one, Ryan. Let's match it up here. So these are the games, just to remind you guys of uh, the SEC non-conference games this year. So if you take all the non-conference games together, Ryan and everybody else joining in, the SEC went 49 and 15 against the other conferences, all the other conferences, including the group of five and the FCS, all non-conference games, 49 and 15 against the power five. There it is, 14 and 13. Doesn't sound too impressive. I think it's a little bit more impressive than that if we really look at the results in the big games against the best teams. The group of five, the SEC went 21 and two. So let's try to find those two losses against the group of five. Of course, the infamous LSU loss at home against Troy, that would be one. And also, I am not finding the other one. Well, of course, it's another infamous one. It was, of course, the uh, Peach Bowl with Auburn losing to Central Florida. So no shame in that as Central Florida was an extremely good football team, but still a group of five loss for the SEC at 21 and two. All right, in FCS games, uh, the SEC took care of business at 14 and 0. I don't know that any other conference can say that against the FCS. The ACC, yes, went 15 and 0. The Big 10 went two and one with Rutgers going down, I believe. The Big 12 at six and one. And uh, the Pac-12 went 10 and one against the FCS with, I believe, Oregon State losing. They lost to just about everybody. So the 14 wins for the SEC. Of course, we had the Alabama win over Clemson. Huge win. Three seed in the SEC defeating the one seed and the number one team in the country at the time, Clemson. Bama, the three, beat Florida State at nine. Of course, that was the huge opening weekend game. Uh, in which uh, Alabama was number one in the country and Florida State two or three, depending on your poll. But as it played out, Florida State finished at uh, seven and six with a bowl win and three and five in the ACC. Yeah, so Dennis is having a good time with the LSU loss against Troy. And it wasn't a last second loss. Uh, 24 to 14 comes to mind. 24 to 14 and a 24 to seven lead in the fourth quarter. And Troy went on to finish, I believe, in a tie for first place in the Sun Belt and won their bowl game by a lot, but it's still a group of five, a mid-level, a Sun Belt team against the LSU Tigers. All right, LSU, their two non-conference wins take away the Troy game against the Power Five. Not impressive, but they won the games, and they won them 
not handily against Syracuse. So that's a 13 seed. Syracuse went two and six in the ACC. So they were the 13 seed in the ACC. Only North Carolina at one and seven was worse than Syracuse. And if you remember how this game played out, LSU and Syracuse, Syracuse was down to 28-26 and driving. Um, LSU turned it back and then they scored a late touchdown with 45 seconds left in the game to win by nine. Uh, don't think that would have affected the line. I'm sure LSU was a 20 point favorite in that game. LSU also on opening night, of course, disposed of BYU and we thought BYU was pretty decent, thought they would win eight games and LSU won that game 27 to nothing. Anybody else who wants to jump, jump on to talk about the SEC or talk about my formula and pick it apart, I don't mind. Jump in and give me some suggestions. I, I think it's a good formula for what it is. This is not saying that whoever wins this is the best conference. It's saying that in 2017, they played the best against the other conferences in the games that were there. In the games that they played, they played the best. All right, so we've got... Uh, Mississippi State, they had a couple of cupcakes out of conference, uh, except for the bowl game, of course. And Mississippi State beat BYU, and they beat UMass. I'm missing the Louisville game. Obviously, Mississippi State won that one as well over Louisville. Did I miss that one? I missed that one on my board. Uh-oh. Looks like the SEC is 15 and 13. You have caught my first mistake. I did have to go live on this one, didn't I? Mississippi State during the regular season beat BYU, who we have as a 12 seed, and UMass as a 14 seed, and Mississippi State's the 6 seed out of the SEC. So if you go to my formula, every game starts out as being worth 14 points for the winner, negative 14 for the loser, and that's because we've got 14 seeds in each conference. Even the conferences that don't have 14 seeds, I had to match them up against the three conferences that do. Uh, and Ryan is saying that's why I tell other Georgia fans not to worry about the LSU road game. If Troy can beat them in Tiger Stadium, so can the Dogs. Well, they can beat them, and they probably will, but they're different teams this year, and LSU is loaded with talent. Yes, Georgia's better right now. Georgia's arguably the best team in the country, but of course, a lot of those guys moving on to the NFL, especially those two out of the backfield and a receiver, and we saw Roquan Smith, uh, or Will, actually, tomorrow at the Combine, and a whole host of other guys, Dominic Sanders included. LSU, new quarterback, new star running back, Darius Geis gone, DJ Shark, we saw him show out at the Combine today. Really good-looking receiver who was probably wasted for the most part, uh, his talent at LSU. All right, bring on the suggestions and the questions and the comments. All right, so I am unfortunately going to have to revise my board. So that makes for another video. <laughs> Mississippi State, how did I miss that? Mississippi State, of course, they beat Louisville in the bowl game. Mississippi State over Louisville. And that was one of my prime upset picks of the bowl season. How could I have missed that when I was doing my calculation. So the SEC at 15 and 13, and we would expect those being like seeds. I believe Louisville was the six and Mississippi State the six out of the SEC. They're both six seeds. So that's going to go up 14 points to 30. All right. Otherwise, Mississippi State skates by with BYU and UMass in the non-conference. Not enough not enough really good non-conference games out of the mid-tier in the SEC. Mississippi State never schedules anyone. Ole Miss almost never schedules anyone. They had the Texas series home and home a few years ago. Uh, Kentucky doesn't schedule out of conference. They had nobody last year. They had nobody out of conference. And uh, Missouri's been a little light in most years. They did have Purdue last year, who turned out to be really good and or pretty good and just annihilated Mizzou in Columbia. So then, of course, you've got the three huge Georgia wins, and they really factor into this. They really boost up the SEC. Georgia beats Oklahoma, the one seed out of the Big 12. They beat Notre Dame, a three seed. 
they beat Georgia Tech in eight seed. So Georgia getting uh, a lot of points for the SEC out of conference, basically 14 to 12, 26, 26 and seven, 33 points. 33 points of that is Georgia. And again, that's going to go up to 30 because I made a mistake with Mississippi State and Louisville. I do not believe I've ever done that before. I hope not. All right. South Carolina beat NC State. Remember week one, Debo Samuel kickoff return to start the game in the season. And South Carolina finished nine and four. They beat North Carolina State. Good win for the SEC. It's the five seed beat the three seed North Carolina State. Uh, we had South Carolina over Michigan. Michigan should have never lost that game, but they screwed it up in the fourth quarter with all sorts of think about what Michigan did in the fourth quarter against South Carolina. They were up 19 to three. They fumbled going into the end zone to make it 26 to three it would have been game over. They threw an end zone pick going in for another touchdown. They muffed a punt off Donovan Peoples Jones face mask. They ran a play in which their H back tight end who had not carried the ball the entire game. And it's like third and three, they give him the ball. He fumbles. It's a bad exchange. And uh, what else happened to Michigan? They did all sorts of stupid things and blew the game. So anyway, South Carolina beats Michigan. Vandy over Kansas State. Nice win for the SEC is the 12 seed beats the, let's say, an eight seed out of the Big 12. Tennessee beat Georgia Tech. For as bad as Tennessee was, they got some points for the SEC. They're the 14 seed going 0-8. They beat Georgia Tech, the 8 seed out of the ACC, and they beat UMass. All right. Ryan gets back in here. If you want to go to a play that highlights how wasted DJ Shark was at LSU, go to the play in the Alabama game where Danny Edling could even make a wide-open seam route over the middle of the field. Can't say that I remember that. I watched most of that game. LSU lost 24-10, to hung in there. Just didn't have enough offense. And Danny Etling did miss some other throws that I remember. Uh, and apparently that one. Maybe I'll uh, go through the 30-minute version on that one and catch the DJ Chark wide open over the middle. So are we talking about a touchdown for sure, Ryan? I could have tightened that thing up. All right. The power five losses for the SEC. And again, they had two group of five losses. One to Troy, one to Central Florida. So the second one to Central Florida, not a huge deal. One of the best teams in the nation. What do you guys think? Central Florida, one of the 12 or 15 best teams in the nation in 2017. That's what I would estimate. Clemson beat Auburn. So that's the one seed in the ACC over the two seed in the SEC. Notre Dame in the bowl game over LSU. Nice win for the Irish. They win as a three seed over LSU, a four seed, six and two. So remember opening night. Uh, remember that, uh, I believe it was the Sunday night game, UCLA, Texas A&M, Josh Rosen down 44 to 10 at the Rose Bowl. Yeah, 35 straight for the Bruins. They beat Texas A&M, 45-44. So UCLA is roughly the nine seed in the Pac-12 and Texas A&M the seven. Cal beat Ole Miss. Uh, TCU beat Arkansas. Not a bad loss for the SEC. 13 seed Arkansas. TCU, the two seed, getting to the championship game. Uh, Chark tested the Alabama DB, Anthony Averett. Uh, Ryan, no one between him and. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Leon, yeah, because it should have been Lindsey Scott throwing to Chark, not Etling. It could have been. Danny Edling, not a bad quarterback, but uh, LSU could do better. Or maybe they can't do better because we haven't seen them do better. Zach Mettenberg, er, aside. Clemson, South Carolina. Clemson destroys South Carolina. And case in point in this one, and maybe this is where I get a little more complicated with the system next year. I think if we're trying to determine who's the best conference, then yes, results are all that matter, the wins and the losses toward a championship, toward standings. All that matters is a one-point win. 
That's all that matters. But in terms of evaluating teams, sure, it matters to me that Clemson didn't beat South Carolina 38-34 or you know, uh, something like that, 38-34, let's say, at a last-second touchdown. They beat South Carolina handily, and 34-10 to did not do it justice. So maybe we put the scoring system in play. Clemson over South Carolina, the one out of the ACC beats the five out of the SEC. Northwestern Kentucky, this could have been a big win for the SEC as the eight seed against the four in the Big Ten, but Kentucky blew it late 24-23. Could not get into the – could not – they scored the touchdown, yes, when Northwestern went for the fourth and inches and then Kentucky scores. Benny Snell out of the game on that bogus, ridiculous, awful call by the ref and kicking him out of the game. And so no Benny Snell, 33% of Kentucky's offense, they lose to Northwestern by one point on the missed two-point conversion. All right, all right, all right. Louisville beat Con Kentucky, uh, Louisville, the sixth seed, beat Kentucky, the eighth seed. Purdue over Mizzou, the seven over the nine. Texas over Mizzou, the five over the nine. Michigan beat Florida on opening weekend. Remember that one, Michigan, the six out of the Big Ten. Florida, a lowly three and five in the Big Ten, four and seven overall. That makes them the 11 seed. And Florida State had little trouble with Florida in the closing weekend. That's the nine in the ACC over the 11 in the SEC. And finally, Wake over Texas A&M. That Wake Forest team, they were underrated last year with John Wolford at uh, quarterback. Wake, the five seed at the ACC and Texas A&M, the seven. Is there a way you could wait blowouts against close games? So, Ryan, have you been listening? That's what I was talking about. That's that's what I think I should do. I just don't want to make this uh, a situation where I'm working on uh, results from 2017 for, for like three months and doing nothing else. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I do think that they should be weighted. You know, think about that Notre Dame LSU game. Notre Dame scores late, really good game. LSU probably should have won the game. Notre Dame makes a couple of plays at the end and they win. And so credit Notre Dame, of course, and take away from LSU and the SEC. But if it was 45 to nothing and Notre Dame showed that they were 10 times better than LSU, well, that should count for more because we're trying to evaluate the teams. And so I do agree with you, Ryan. I just don't know how I would weigh it to make it fair, almost in a BCS kind of way where I would weight the scores I would look at the scores and they would count, but in a diminishing return, meaning like a 50 to nothing. Once it got to be a ridiculous, you can only gain so much ground off of a blowout. So, yeah, if you look at the power five wins that the SEC had, Bama over Clemson, very impressive. You're taking your best team, or at the time, we didn't know second or third best team in the SEC because they did lose to Auburn. Uh, but the national champion, and they beat Clemson, the number one seed, the number one team in the nation, certainly the number one team in the ACC, and they beat them down 24 to 6. So, Ryan, that's your example right there that really shows us Alabama not squeaking by Clemson, but dominating most of the game. It was a defensive struggle. Clemson's defense was outstanding, but Alabama clearly the better team. Ryan, Wake Forest was one of the most fun football teams to watch last season, especially that bowl game against Texas A&M. I just could not believe what I was seeing in Wake Forest's precision throwing the ball and the athletes they had on the outside. I can't think of the kids' names. Uh, I'm going to kick myself because two and three years ago, I used to have an SB Nation guy from Wake Forest on, and he set me up with all these names that uh, were coming into the program, and uh, I used to know them, but I can't think of the Wake Forest uh, wide receivers' names that played so well in that bowl game with John Wolford at quarterback. Yeah, fun team to watch. Um, and Wolford now moving on to the NFL. And so where was I with all this? I was trying to make a point. Uh, you know, the 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 LSU-BYU, the LSU-Syracuse games, Mississippi State beating BYU and UMass, those shouldn't really matter that much. Yes, 
you count those as wins for the SEC and they get points, but you're beating down teams that are far less in seeding than the team you're matching them up against. So there should almost be a penalty in a sense for an LSU struggling at home against a Syracuse. Yes, credit them with a win, but they didn't handle Syracuse in the three to four touchdown fashion that was expected. And Syracuse, the next to last seed in the ACC. So Ryan, there's your point right there. Uh, what would be another good example would be, uh, yeah, the rest of these games were pretty close. Tennessee slopped by UMass. Uh, I think that game was like 14 to 14 to 10. Uh, in terms of power five losses, Auburn losing to Clemson, not an issue on the road, especially LSU. Like we said, Notre Dame, that could have went either way. It was a coin flip. Texas A&M losing at UCLA. Yeah, they're a little bit better. C Texas A&M went seven and five. UCLA six and six, and it was on the road. The home road factor we could put into play as well. We could add that to it. Arkansas losing to TCU is not an issue. Um, that shouldn't count highly. Again, South Carolina losing to Clemson not a big deal, but they were just run in. Uh, Cam Serenay, yeah, he's the tight end. So I've known about Cam Serenay for a long time. Oh, yeah, Ryan Mel. You've got uh, Greg Dorch. Yes, and he was hurt for the bowl game, and he was their best receiver. And even without Dorch, yes, Scotty Washington was the guy that really impressed me against Texas A&M in the belt bowl. Yeah, Scotty Washington. Thank you. Uh, Kentucky losing to Northwestern, as we mentioned, by one point. The four seed in the Big Ten, a team that finished with 10 wins, not a huge issue for the SEC. Uh, Kentucky did get blasted by Louisville, not great. Mizzou with a bad loss against Purdue, losing 35-3. So that's where that comes into play. Mizzou losing as a 7-5 and five team to Purdue, a 6-6 six and six team out of the Big Ten. It's not awful, but they lost at home, and they lost 35-3. Drew Locke, Jamon Moore, they scored three points. Uh, Florida, Florida State, Florida, Michigan, not a big deal there. And Texas A&M loses to Wake in a game that was a toss-up and without their coach at the end of the season and much of their coaching staff. So this is where I think that the SEC is probably the best conference and played the best in 2017. Uh, the Big Ten will have the best numbers against the rest of the conferences, and they played really well, and I do believe the Big Ten is the second best conference. Uh, the numbers are going to say Big Ten at 16 and 7, and they came out with, uh, if you guys watched the video, it was like a plus, plus 110, plus 90, whatever it was, something in the 100 range. Uh, but the Big Ten really beat up on the Pac-12, and credit the Big Ten. They went out and took care of business, but Ohio State over USC by 17. Penn State beat Washington by a touchdown, and that Michigan State beat down of Washington State. So the Pac-12 really fell prey to the Big Ten, and the Big Ten cleaned up when they didn't have to. They, they had their best teams matching up against like-seeded teams, but teams in the Pac-12 that just weren't up to the challenge. If Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan State had to play, let's say, the three best teams in any of the other leagues, but especially the SEC, we could be looking at a different story. We could be looking at three really good games and not Michigan State annihilating Washington State or Ohio State dominating USC. But, man, Ohio State, Penn State, Michigan State against Alabama, Georgia, and LSU or Clemson, Miami. North Carolina State, I think the Big Ten would have the edge there, but not necessarily against the SEC. Yes, Swake also had some good running backs like Matt Coburn yeah, and Cade Carney. Yeah, and those guys, uh, I think they were either juniors or seniors. But um, And we know little about the Wake offensive line, but they had to have gotten a lot better because these two backs that you mentioned, Coburn and Carney, they have been playing there at Wake <laughs> their entire careers, three to four years, 
and uh, they played a lot of football and just now blossomed. All right, so notable games for the SEC in the group of five. Uh, Alabama beat Fresno State. Nice win. Of course, Alabama's a huge favorite and should be expected to beat Fresno, but still, you beat a team that went to a group of five championship game. So it's a good win. Bama beat Colorado State. Uh, Kentucky beat Southern Miss. Florida beat UAB. There's really nothing here. Tennessee beat Southern Miss. Vandy beat Western Kentucky and Middle Tennessee. And of course, Troy beat LSU. It's almost like two years ago or three years ago where Jacksonville took Auburn to overtime. And of course, UAB. It was UAB that beat Florida, right? In Gainesville. That was UAB, correct? All right. Uh, let's see if you guys have anything else. Maybe I will uh, look at some a week. I think we just looked at week three. We went through weeks two and three most recently. Georgia beat one of the uh, Sun Belt champion app states. Yeah. Yeah. I, I didn't uh, go through every group of five game for the, because there were 23 of them, but wrote down the notable games that I thought, uh, yeah, good group of five team in App State. Uh, Georgia won that game. And of course, that's the game that Jacob Eason was hurt and ushered in uh, a new era of Georgia quarterbacking. All right. The SEC went six and five against the ACC. They went one and three against the Big Ten. They went two and two against the Big 12. They went 0-2 uh, against the Pac-12. Is that right? Yeah, that's uh, Texas A&M losing at the Rose Bowl, and that's Ole Miss losing to Cal. <laughs> so that seems out of kilter. The SEC lost two out of two to the Pac-12, but that's what it is. And against the Independents, uh, the SEC beat up on UMass and BYU, and so they went 5-1, and one, the one loss, of course, to Notre Dame. And, and the ACC record 7-5. and five. So... Man, do I cut another video? That's going to be plus 30. That's Mississippi State winning over Louisville, 15 and 13 for the SEC. So what's impressive here is that basically the SEC is winning 15 games, 15 games with no losses, with teams that won 60% of their games in the conference, and they're beating – teams that are just as good in the other conferences. So those are ACC, Big Ten, and Big 12 teams that won 60% of their games in the conference, just like the teams they played out of the SEC, but the SEC won 15 of those, 15-0. and 0. And then, yes, they lost 13 consecutive games, but you know they had a decided disadvantage uh, one game under 500 playing teams that were 17 over 500. Sure, they should have won some of those games. Uh, you know, if Texas A&M would have held on against UCLA or LSU, could have pulled it out against Notre Dame, which they didn't. Uh, those would be the two obvious ones that they could have turned around. Uh, but yeah, those were Texas A&M in the bowl game against Wake. The other ones... You know, Kentucky could have beaten Northwestern, but the, the other ones, they were pretty much handled. Texas handled Mizzou. Purdue handled Mizzou. Michigan dominated Florida. The two pick sixes kept the Gators in the game. Florida State outclassed Florida. Clemson annihilated South Carolina. Jacob Eason is going to Washington. Yes. Okay. What am I smoking? I'm talking about Jacob Eason getting knocked out against uh, App State. Yeah, because LSU got Jacob Beeson transferring from Georgia. Oh, sorry, Ryan. I thought you were picking on me there. <laughs> You're going after Dennis. Yes, 0-2 uh, against Pac-12 such this point. I mean, such a shame. Such a shame. All right, so that's what we've got. And the seedings in the SEC look like this. Georgia's the one, of course. Auburn's the two. Bama, the national champion, the three seed. LSU was the four at six and two. Then you've got some five and three teams in South Carolina, number five, Mississippi State, number six. Texas A&M, the seven, Kentucky, the eight, Mizzou, the nine, Ole Miss, the 10, 
Florida 11, Vandy 12, Arkansas 13, and Tennessee 14. All right. I've enjoyed it. Uh, is there anything you guys want to discuss? I will let you know that just here in the last day, I have had two UCLA discussions with Tony Siracusa of Last Word on College Football and Mike Regalado of Gojo Bruin. Those we will continue to be released in the next few days as the Bruins go to spring practice on March 6th. Tons of USC content coming uh, as well from 24-7 and from rivals with uh, Drew Krinsky and Keely Yor from Trojan Insider and from uscfootball.com. Uh, Mike Laval from Last Word on College Football for you Tennessee SEC fans. We uh, went down some coaching changes and what his thoughts are about uh, the potential success of guys like Jeremy Pruitt, Jimbo Fisher, Joe Moorhead, and the rest of the new coaches in the SEC. Uh, Alabama, Stephen M. Smith, you got to catch those videos to set you up for spring practice. He breaks it all down. Uh, NFL draft and combine uh, editions with uh, Teddy the Bear Tate. Got to check this guy out. He loves his NFL draft. And we talked up uh, running backs and Barkley and Michelle and Chubb and a few guys under the radar. Uh, we also had some good discussions with, uh, actually, if you want to hear from a group of five coach, a class act, I interviewed uh, Air Force Falcons head coach Troy Calhoun this week. It was a really nice discussion, really good man. He's been on three times, and uh, we're trying to get coaches on, and it's, you guys can imagine, extremely difficult to get head coaches group of five or power five on. I've had uh, the only two power five coaches I've had on were uh, Gary Anderson at Oregon State and Sonny Dykes when he was at Cal. I've had about a dozen group of five coaches on and I am efforting, but it takes a lot of time and a lot of emails back and forth to try to find the right timing. And obviously I get denied by most as most would, uh, but uh, I keep trying and uh, I would like to get some offensive and defensive coordinators on. Uh, as you can see, I've got a lot of recruits that I've interviewed in the last six to nine months as well. Ryan writes, hey, Mark, who is your new Georgia media consultant going to be? Do I have to have a new one? I talked to Savannah Lee Richardson. Uh, just she contacted me today to say spring practice is firing up. Let's get after it. So I said, sure. Now I am always looking for more media contributors. As you can tell with Miami, Cam Underwood has been doing a phenomenal job for me for three to four years, five years. I think 2013 was the first time I had Cam on. Would love to have him on every week. Uh, the schedules don't always match. And so I've thought I, I would like to provide Miami football coverage more consistently. And I want to provide everybody more consistently. But uh, I know that I've got a Miami audience, so I want to deliver uh, on the Canes and also get different perspectives. So I brought in the, uh, the, the campus writer who runs the campus uh, newspaper, Isaiah Kim Martinez. I brought in Antoine Staley with Athlon Sports, who covers Miami football. Also from the U family, our guy, uh, Alonzo Oliver. So, and I, I'm efforting more people. I figure that I can't go wrong with going after the people from Scout and Rivals and 247 Sports, those people in particular. Peter Burns, you guys know Peter Burns, right? Uh, ESPN and the SEC Network, we just cut something the other day, and most of those videos have been released. We talked uh, most of the major teams in the SEC and the outlook for the spring practice. So wild idea out of Ricky. Get rid of conferences, have 130 independent teams. Yeah, wild idea. Um, I'll let you guys know what I was looking at today and trying to figure out. Uh, Kirk Ferentz would love to get Kirk Ferentz on. That'd be phenomenal. If you can pull some strings, that would be great. His sports information director is getting a letter just like he has every off season for about five years. And then I follow up with phone calls. So I'm trying, even though it's about a 1% chance that I'm going to get 
uh, that level of a coach to come on at this point. Hey, I even give them the numbers. I say, hey, 408,000 views in 2016, 1.1 million last year. We're growing, we're growing. So give us a chance. I won't ask stupid questions. So uh, who else do you guys have? Yeah, why do you have such a big Miami following? Um, the, the main reason I believe I've got such a big Miami following is that uh, Kim Underwood, so this was probably late 2013, if I remember. So if you guys would go back to the very beginning of Mark Rogers TV, I talk college football all the time, but it was just me. I covered everyone. And if I wanted to do a Miami preview, a season preview, let's say, and I do that in the summer, I would just pour over my homework and deliver the Miami preview. Uh, then it hit me that number one, I gained more exposure on some other platforms. I gained some credibility from hearing from different perspectives and I couldn't be the expert with everyone. So I started to reach out to uh, mostly SB Nation people, <clears throat> Bleacher Report, those people. It's kind of expanded to 247 Sports and, and uh, Rivals with all the recruiting uh, business. But uh, Cam Underwood was one of the first people I had on and he used to post my videos on SB Nation, on State of the U. And I think people just migrated over from there. And so he helped me out a ton. Uh, there are so many internet Miami fans. They just don't go to the games, I guess. But there are internet fans there. So I was looking at this. Consider this. Pick your conference. But let's start with the SEC. This drives me nuts. Scheduling. The scheduling imbalance, especially in the 14 team leagues, is ridiculous. Throw out the bias or the perception about the teams that we're talking about. Just understand that, at least I believe, and if you agree with me, that the scheduling should be as balanced and equal and even as we possibly can make it. So, for example, Georgia, I know they can handle it, they're this good. But Georgia this season, in addition to playing their division opponents, will play Auburn and LSU in the other division. Auburn and LSU went 13-3 and in the SEC last year. Tennessee, in addition to their division opponents, of course, play Alabama, as they always do. And they also play Auburn. So those two went 14-2 and in the SEC. So Tennessee has to play two teams that went 14 and two while Vandy plays two teams in the other division, the SEC West, Ole Miss and Arkansas, who went four and 12. Now, how is that fair competition when Vandy and Tennessee play the exact same division schedule and then Tennessee has to play two teams that went 14 and two the previous year and Vandy plays two teams that went four and 12? Makes no sense. Uh, that's the worst example in the SEC, or the best example in the ACC. <coughs> so Florida State plays Miami, of course. They play Virginia Tech. Those teams went at 12 and 4 in the ACC. They're trying to catch Clemson, right? Well, Clemson plays Georgia Tech and Duke. They went 7 and 9, those two teams. Georgia Tech and Duke went seven and nine in conference play. And so Clemson gets the benefit of playing two teams that went seven and nine last year, while Florida State's two games that are different than Clemson are against two teams that went 12 and four. So that's um, the direct correlation or comparison between Clemson and Florida State. Now, Florida State, again, besides their division games, they've got Miami and they've got Virginia Tech who went 12 and four combined in the ACC last year. Syracuse plays Pitt and North Carolina. They went four and 12 in the ACC last year. That's just, that's not fair. <laughs> that's not equitable scheduling. So I, was, I basically worked out a schedule here in which we would maintain the rivalries in the ACC, the cross division rivalries. Miami, Florida State, North Carolina State, North Carolina, Clemson, Georgia Tech, Pitt, Syracuse. But I made sure that everybody, everybody plays two teams in the other division who either went eight and eight or seven and nine. 
and uh, still working on this. But um, the only issue to any of this, or it would be easy to line them all up to play eight and eight, two teams that went eight and eight the year before, the only thing that makes it difficult is because obviously one division's better than the other, so they have more winning records, and so there's an imbalance of records to try to match them up. But it, it can come very close. And then in the Big Ten, I saw where one team out of the Big Ten West, I don't know who it is off the top of my head, I think it's Northwestern, has to play three of the Giants in the Big Ten East. And one of their main competitors, let's say it's Iowa, plays none of them. How is that fair? I won't go through the schedules right now because it would take me forever to try to weed through the Big Ten Western Division to see who these teams are. But there's a team that plays, let's say, Ohio State, Michigan, Michigan State, and one of their chief competitors in the same division doesn't play any of those teams and plays Maryland, Indiana, and Rutgers. So one team's playing three teams that went a combined uh, like 23 and four last year and in, in conference. And they're one of their competitors in the same division is playing three teams in the Big Ten East that went um, something like six and 27 or six and 21 out of 27 games in the conference. All right, we, we've got our friend coming back here. And we've got Ryan, of course. Nebraska's schedule balance is completely unfair compared to Iowa. That That's probably the, the two that I'm looking for, Ryan. Um, and I also want to let you guys know that it's going to be a few weeks, so be patient with me. But there's a few things I'm going to get worked out to help you guys out in terms of following me and jumping on the live streams. Number one is going to be the notifications. So I've got a um, operations guru of sorts. So this guy worked with me at ESPN. He worked at ESPN in production operations for 19 years. He worked with me for 14 or 15 years. Uh, we used to do an internet show together talking about television work. Uh, but he's my, he's my go-to guy. So he's going to work out the notifications for me. And also I'm going to attempt to get the software and the other um, software that I need basically is what it is to be able to record the chat. So I can see the chat. We all can see the chat live, but then it posts and you lose the chat uh, unless you have the software. So I'm going to, my, my hopes in the next several weeks, give me some time. I've got a number of things going on personally that I need to take care of. But here in the next few weeks, uh, looking for a little bit better look, but also the chat to be recorded so you guys can always see it. And then to get those notifications out so you know when the live stream is coming and to schedule those, usually, sometimes I'll just jump on out of nowhere and start talking. But uh, generally, I would like to get those live streams out there and the notifications uh, about eight or 10 hours beforehand so you guys can schedule and, and try to make it. Yeah, Nebraska under Scott Frost, they have a rough go this first year, but that might be a blessing in disguise. Hey, cut your teeth against the best in the Big Ten East when you don't have a realistic chance of winning your division, and then I would expect Scott Frost is going to be in the running here with Wisconsin and Iowa and Northwestern here in a couple of years. So between Wisconsin being the best, by far, right now, the best program in the Big Ten West, and Northwestern Iowa, right, being right there. They're the two that are right there. Minnesota was, now they've dropped off, but PJ Flex on the scene, and they've got a, a ridiculous facility coming. Have you guys seen this facility coming? I saw the PJ Fleck um, show, whatever it's called, getting to know PJ Fleck or whatever it's called, being PJ Fleck on ESPN. And this massive, uh, complex that they're building is mighty impressive uh, in the Twin Cities at Minnesota. So if Minnesota comes back to what they were a few years ago, winning eight, nine games, and uh, Nebraska with Scott Frost, we would expect, then you've got an interesting division because there's not going to be any heavyweight heavyweights 
there's no Clemson's or Ohio State's there, but you got a lot of teams competing for a championship year in, year out. All right. Very good, guys. I appreciate you jumping on board. Okay, I can finally get down to where we want to talk some football and get past all the silliness. Ricky, we don't make our Big Ten schedule. We got lucky. All tough games at home except Penn State. Of course you don't make the schedule. You can't help that. But there should be somebody, so I was explaining this to somebody today. I can almost give a pass to the ACC and the SEC for bad scheduling because they've got the one cross-division rivalry. they got to keep that, and then they just do a rotation. They don't care what anybody's record was the year before. Now, the Big Ten has some kind of format, but I can't figure it out. They basically just have three teams play uh, in the other division. Well, somebody in that room, when they're building the schedules, has to say, hmm, Nebraska's got to play Ohio State, Penn State, and Michigan. And I was playing Rutgers, Maryland, and Indiana. Uh, that That's not fair. We, we can't do that because they're playing six teams exactly the same. They're playing each other. And so the only three-game difference here is they're playing three of the best 10 or 12 teams in the country, and they're playing three lightweights. Uh, this makes this competition for a division championship completely unfair. In this case, Iowa, and I don't know if it's Iowa, I believe it is, Ricky, plays the three cupcakes in the other division. You've got, okay, you've got Penn State. That's right, you've got Penn State, but the other two are easy, and you can't get it perfect. Uh, you can't get it to where everybody plays two toughies and one cupcake because there aren't enough toughies versus the cupcakes. There's going to be an imbalance of sorts, uh, but you can, you can give it some equality there. Uh, so certainly that's not Iowa's issue, but uh, somebody in that room has to be looking at that to say, these two teams are competing for a division championship. They can't, it can't be this unjust. Iowa could lose that game to Nebraska very conceivably and still have a much better record in the conference because of the disparity in the rest of the schedule. Ah, Ryan, also another thing about the unfairness for Nebraska is that those good teams out of the East is that all those games are on the road. Are they really? Yeah, Ohio State played at Nebraska last time this past season, so that's probably on the road. And uh, the other ones, yeah, at Happy Valley, really? Anyway, I think Minnesota is definitely interesting moving forward with Flack. I do too. PJ Flack, he's got me sold. I understand. You know how some of those guys that act like him, some of them drive you crazy and they're annoying and aggravating and seem kind of fake and false and just not real, but then other ones sell you? And he, he's got me sold. I like PJ Fleck. And uh, I think he's going to do th good things in Minnesota. The recruiting is always going to be a challenge there. So he needs to lock down the state, and that's not nearly enough. But I would think Texas, I would think Illinois, which has decent football, would be a place to go. Oklahoma, I guess that's the route if you're at Minnesota. And then, of course, you go to Florida. But uh, other than that, I, I think you stay kind of Midwest and you try to, to, to get those skilled players out of Texas and try to get a few of them to help you out. And maybe you run some offensive and defensive schemes that are a bit different. It's a thought. Uh, I had somebody suggest, I'm trying to think who that was. I believe it was Steve Dace from Michigan Podcast. Than Nebraska based on their recruiting challenges and getting skill position players, but based on their ability to get interior linemen out of Iowa and Nebraska and those states should go to a triple option. Don't know that I agree with that, but I understand the thinking. Understand the thinking there. The other thing that I'll put on my list for my, for my operations guy would be, how do I boot people out of this chat? So we all know who I'm talking about. All right, everyone, I appreciate it. Uh, if you guys have anything else, uh, throw it at me. Do you think that Virginia will get to a competitive level in the ACC under Bronco? I do. Uh, if you look at the division, if Pitt can succeed there with a, 
NFL stadium. I don't know how Pitt attracts too many football players who think, okay, I'm going to a school in which they don't prioritize football enough to have a collegiate stadium. But Pitt, sure, they only won five games last season, but they typically win their seven or eight games, seven and five, eight and four. That's their deal and has been for quite a while. Virginia high school talent, very similar to Pennsylvania high school talent. I know that they have academic restrictions. It's a difficult school to get into at the University of Virginia. But Duke, look at what they've done under David Cutcliffe. Nothing great, but they did win a division. They got to that ACC championship game. They played Arizona State in a bowl game in the Sun Bowl. They followed it up with another outstanding team that almost beat Johnny Manziel. And yeah, they had a bad season last year, but it looks like, you know, Duke's going to be in that seven and five range under David Cutcliffe. If Duke can do it, Pitt can do it. Georgia Tech running a triple option offense. Now they're sitting right in the middle of some of the best talent in America. And for some reason, they, they basically don't get any of them. Georgia Tech never has good recruiting classes. They can't bring in any of those elite, none of those elite Georgia kids. But Georgia Tech does their thing, seven and five, eight and four. If you look at Virginia and what they've given us since the early 80s, up until about 10 years ago, they gave us what everybody else in the ACC Coastal Division's given us, except for Miami potentially, and that's North Carolina. Another example. What do we what do we expect out of North Carolina going forward? You know, they had the, the aberration this past year, but even when they had those NFL receivers and Mitch Trubisky and Elijah Hood and North Carolina has sent um, NFL players at a top 10 to 15 level to the NFL in the past 10 or 15 years, but they haven't exceeded that. So why can't Virginia be right in that line of seven and five, eight and four? I see it happening. Bronco Mendenhall, exceptional job at BYU. Why can't he do that at Virginia? Yes, I absolutely think that Virginia will be competitive. They moved it from 2-10 and 10 to 6-6 six and six this past year, and that team had a lot of issues. And they still were able to navigate 6-6. Six and six. So they're an up-and-comer. Up uh, Miami owns the division. They should Virginia Tech would be that second team. There's almost like three tiers emerging. Miami, Virginia Tech, everybody else. And I have a hard time distinguishing Pitt, Georgia Tech, Duke, and the rest of them, North Carolina and Virginia. They are going to be the same program, it appears, going forward. Nebraska plays Michigan State at home. Yeah, let's see. The last time that Nebraska played Michigan State at home, they pulled off an upset. That was the year that Michigan State 2015 went to the college football playoffs, lost only one game in the Big Ten, lost only one game, and that was to a Nebraska team that won five games. All elite Georgia players either go to Georgia, Clemson, or elsewhere throughout the SEC, none left over for the Yellow Jackets. And... Yeah, uh, Paul Johnson makes it work. He usually has a decent team. They won an Orange Bowl a few years ago. They went to 9-4 and four the year before last and beat Kentucky in a bowl game. They're a good program. They're a top 40 program. But if you look at the recruiting rankings, they are nowhere to be found ever. They're usually 50, 45, 50, 55 in that range. All right, I appreciate you guys jumping on board for the live stream tonight as I unveiled uh, the final of my five conferences, although uh, we've got a little addendum to make with Mississippi State's win over Louisville. I apologize. I, I just bypassed that one. 15 and 13 for the SEC against the Power Five and a plus 30.02. The math is easy for me because Louisville is six seed, Mississippi State is six seed. That's a 14-point win for the SEC. And I did get it right for the ACC. I did include that loss for the ACC, so I don't have to adjust 
the ACC. So based on the points, it's Big Ten 1, SEC 2, Big 12 3. I'm going to have to look it up. I think <laughs> the other ones. What do I believe? I do believe that the SEC is slightly better than the Big Ten. The ACC is number three. The Big 12 is four. The Pac-12 has just declined. Oregon, UCLA have hurt the Pac-12. Their decline in the last four to five years has hurt uh, the Pac-12 tremendously. Who did that five and seven Nebraska team make a bowl? Yes, they did. And they beat UCLA and Josh Rosen in his freshman season. And they racked up like 400 yards rushing in that game in the Foster Farms Bowl. Yes, Ricky remembers it well. All right, guys, I appreciate you jumping on board. Uh, we will see you next time. And uh, I have a ton of content coming your way. Let me know what you, what you watch. So if, if I send you 10 or 12, 15 videos and you are just not interested, that doesn't mean I'm going to stop focusing on those particular teams, but I'd like to know what you guys think will not only resonate with you, but with college football fans. I think stuff like this will, I just have to get it in the hands and in front of the right people, but um, breaking down possible playoff systems, top 25s, uh, scheduling formulas uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few weeks and uh, conference rankings and power polls and all that sort of thing. I think uh, drive some views and we'll get people excited. So uh, thanks for joining me on a Saturday night, Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football. So that means my voice, your voice, my contributors, my media contributors coming on all our voice together. We are the voice of college football. See you next time.